All right, and we're live. Hello, everybody who's watching this video. Thank you for watching our video on COVID-19 coping and alcohol. I'm Neha Chandani. And I'm Evan Souk. And we are Counseling Center Paraprofessionals. So this means that we've been trained to facilitate, uh, to research and to put together presentations and outreaches like this, but this doesn't make us clinicians. So if you find you maybe need to consult with an expert or you need some more resources, uh, feel free to fast forward or hang in until we get to the end. We'll go over some resources, local and regional and national if need be. Uh, but if you feel you maybe need to stop, feel free to pause and maybe go to the Counseling Center website or give them a call if you need to consult with a clinician. Uh, but yeah, I think with that being said, we are set to go. Um, so before we really start talking and going into depth about our topic, we wanted to go over how COVID has been affecting our mental health. And according to experts uh, by uh, Dr. Deborah Kaysen, uh, people are experiencing a collective stressor rather than a traumatic event, but that some people are also experiencing traumatic events caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, a quote by Dr. Lucy McBride and Dr. Roxanne Cohen-Silver, uh, we are experiencing collective trauma unlike anything previously experienced in America in our lifetimes. And the last quote by Dr. Phoebe Tucker and Dr. Christopher S. Uh, Zapala, post-COVID stress disorder, uh, another emerging consequence of a global pandemic. And basically all these quotes uh, may sound different, but there is a commonality that COVID has really caused a lot of stress and caused a lot of trauma for people. And it's particularly hard because a lot of people have to really stay distant from people they are used to talking to, socializing with, and Overall, it's been very hard um, on mental health in general. Yeah, so to kind of talk about that, we wanted to introduce how stress, trauma, and alcohol might relate. So uh, research has shown that stress and trauma tend to exasperate alcohol use. So that means that stress and trauma tend to increase or intensify how people use alcohol use. Dependence on alcohol can lead to higher levels of depression and anxiety. So if someone already has depression and anxiety, uh, increasing the alcohol use, intensifying how you use it can just make it worse. According to the International Society for Traumatic Studies, a quarter to three quarters of people, so 25 to 75% of people who have survived abusive or violent traumatic experiences report problematic alcohol use. And we'll kind of go into what that means a little later. And then one tenth to one third, so about 10% to 33% of people who survive accident, illness, or disaster related trauma report problematic alcohol use, especially if troubled by persistent health problems or pain. So we bring these statistics to the forefront because we do want to highlight that there is an association between stress, trauma, and alcohol. Uh, these studies and different examples of trauma kind of show that folks who go through it there is uh, an association with increasing alcohol use. Uh, and especially if there's already been persistent health problems or pain, uh, something that has been brought by COVID, COVID itself has been known to cause, it can possibly lead to a dependence on alcohol or just higher, level, higher levels of drinking. So we just wanted to emphasize that COVID's already a trauma and trauma already has its links to alcohol to show that you know, that, that, get, that bridge is there. That connection is definitely viable. So going off of that, uh, we want to go over another statistic uh, in terms of alcohol purchasing. Uh, so if we compare alcohol sales from the week of March 21st, 2019 to the week of March 21st, 2020, when the lockdown first occurred for a lot of people, um, In-store alcohol purchases were 50%, 54% higher, eventually leveling to 21%, and online alcohol purchases were 262% higher, eventually leveling to 234%. And this shows that a lot of people turned to alcohol to cope with a lot of the mental health struggles that they faced um, through being locked down, being separated from one another, being, you know, kind of having to be distant from one another. And it shows that 
alcohol is definitely something that was used during the lockdown phase that as, as a coping mechanism, basically. Yeah, so we kind of wanted to show how this impacts U of I students specifically. So these numbers come from the 2018 UIUC core drug and alcohol survey. So this was a little, this was a little bit before the pandemic happened, but we did want to talk about some of the statistics here. So uh, as defined here, binging is defined as men having five and women having four or more drinks in one sitting. So 46.5% of Illinois students who took the survey binged within the previous two weeks compared to 38.1% of their regional counterparts. On the positive side, as seen in the middle statistic, 53.5% of Illinois students don't binge. And then the last one, 67.8% of Illinois students consumed alcohol in the past year compared to 65.1% of their counterparts. So uh, this can almost be used as a baseline, but we just wanted to highlight like drinking is something that is prevalent on the campus. Um, a lot of students do it. And as we kind of mentioned with COVID, you know, coming in, causing a lot of stress, causing a lot of trauma uh, for a lot of people who were surveyed in other studies, the alcohol use increased. So it's probably something safe to assume that the same thing happened to Illinois students. So there's a possibility that some of these numbers also increase. And so we just wanted to give a comparison to show how it's not just, you know, national studies where the numbers increased. It's very possible that even Illinois students where this is a little more personal, it hits a little more to home. This also might have also possibly occurred. Yeah, so next we uh, wanted to define what binge drinking is. So binge drinking is a pattern of drinking that brings blood alcohol concentration level to 0 0.08 grams per deciliter. So for women, that's four drinks in two hours, and for men, that's five drinks in two hours. And considering that binge drinking is very uh, popular among college students, uh, we felt that it was very, it was a necessary topic to uh, talk about and cover. Yeah, to briefly add on to that, 0 0.08 may seem like a very familiar number to a lot of people. That is also the legal amount as to when someone is considered drunk. So if you've seen 0 0.08 in conjunction with alcohol or what it means in terms of eyes of the law, uh, you're considered drunk if your BAC is around that level too. So we wanted to also touch, so how binge drinking can be problematic. So uh, according to the American Addiction Centers, compared to someone who is legally intoxicated, so below the 0 0.08, like I mentioned, uh, if you're at 0 0.08 or higher, you're much more likely to have poor decision-making skills, lose emotional control, uh, and be more at risk of being involved with an accident. So when your BAC is a little bit higher, uh, it tends to slow down a lot of the critical processes that are happening in your brain, especially executive function. So your decision-making skills can be a little more impaired. It might be a little harder to rationalize or fully see the consequences or just the effects of a decision, uh, kind of the same thing with emotional control. You maybe start seeing a little less of the rational and you become a little more emotional. And then because of this, there is a higher possibility of being involved with an accident depending on decisions that are made and if you possibly don't think through some of the decisions you make. Um, so continuing on, uh, individuals who habitually engage in binge drinking are also at a high risk of developing an alcohol use disorder. And binge drinking typically starts in early adulthood, so often in college. Uh, those who continue to binge drink are more likely to become heavy drinkers and develop alcohol abuse or alcohol use disorders. And as we went over previously, um, binge drinking is a pretty popular thing to do in college and those who do our studies have shown that they typically do uh, develop alcohol use disorders and find it difficult to decrease the amount of alcohol that they consume even after they leave college. Yeah, so on this we did mention alcohol use disorder so here are some signs I'll just go through a couple of them. There's quite a few, but feel free to pause the video or take a picture if you kind of just want this, as a, want this as a reference in your back pocket. So uh, signs of an alcohol use disorder are being unable to control how much you drink. So maybe 
you're trying to cut down, but it's a little harder. Maybe uh, you end up drinking more than you wanted to. Being unable to control when you drink. So this can be something like if you maybe started doing it in the evening or you would do it at night, but uh, if you have alcohol use disorder, maybe you start doing it in the morning or during the day uh, and you just, you can't stop yourself. That's maybe an example. Uh, kind of going down a little bit more, having to drink in order to feel normal or good. Um, this can be a sign of alcohol use disorder because to kind of, when we're using the word normal, it's sort of a neutral word, how we feel maybe on most days. So having used, having to use alcohol just to feel like a normal person, kind of when you, how you feel on an average day is a sign that you might have an alcohol use disorder. Uh, continuing to drink despite negative consequences in your personal or professional life. So this kind of goes back to how we talked about how binge drinking can sort of impact your brain and how it can impact executive function. So, you know, at this point, it's clear you might have alcohol use disorder if even the consequences, so like maybe your friendships are falling apart, your relationships are falling apart, maybe you got in trouble at work, maybe you got fired. Um, it might seem like if you're in deep, you possibly don't care anymore. So that's another cautious sign to see if you have alcohol use disorder. Um, and then finally, experiencing blackouts or periods of time when you can't remember what you did, where you were, or who you were with. So this tends to happen after binge drinking, if you consume enough alcohol, you can experience a blackout. And so uh, if you start experiencing blackouts, as we mentioned, the plural, uh, and if there's more than one or just several periods of time where you kind of, it's a blank spot in your memory, uh, that can be indicative that you might be drinking too, you might be binge drinking. And if you're constantly binge drinking and this is happening, uh, it could be a sign of an alcohol use disorder. Um, so the Cleveland Clinic did a study and asked people uh, why they drink alcohol during times of stress. And so there are many reasons, but the most popular ones were as a depressant. It can provide you with a bit of relaxation up front, releasing endorphins and boosting serotonin levels. Accessibility. So it's just very easy to get. Um, it's just everywhere. It's a lot of people seem to be using it. So it, it's not much of a difficult substance to acquire and for the culture. So if everyone else is really doing it, then more people are inclined to um, use alcohol as well. And yeah. Yeah, so for coping, we also touched on why alcohol should not be used. So mm -hmm. the first thing is it can become an addiction. So. Some of those signs kind of look like the signs we mentioned when we talk about uh, alcohol use disorder. Uh, if it becomes an addiction, it can lead to a number of effects. So uh, it's been proven alcohol addiction can really do a number on the brain. So uh, when you drink, you don't kill brain cells. That's a common myth, but you can damage them. And if you damage them enough through drinking a lot, um, things like your coordination, you know, decision making. Um, that kind of higher executive functioning we talked about, like that can get impaired. So it can be a little slower. You maybe can't do it as quickly. Uh, that's like one effect that can happen. Another is it damages the body. So another like physical effects is like cirrhosis where it really impacts your liver. And cirrhosis is usually very late stage where, you know, your liver is not necessarily working anymore, which is really dangerous. Uh, and cirrhosis is usually a sign that alcohol addiction might be at play because that's where alcohol is processed. So cirrhosis doesn't happen overnight. It takes a while to get to that point, uh, but that's another effect. And then we kind of mentioned before, just your professional, your personal life, you can lose friendships, relationships, you know, you might be in trouble at work. So it's not even just like how it impacts your body necessarily, but impacts your life in general. It can just be outside of your body, but even those effects can be very dangerous. So Ultimately, it just, it tends to lead to a lot of negative health outcomes. Um, and depending on how the addiction sort of goes on for, just depending on different factors, you can't necessarily, necessarily reverse these effects. You know, some folks who have been addicted in the past have found that when they are, when they stop being addicted, when they're able to sort of get back on track, 
um, the functioning, the coordination, how it impacts your brain can sometimes heal. It can kind of recover. Um, you know, if you don't drink a lot, your liver won't hit cirrhosis since it's not having to process it, but that's in some cases, you know, sometimes it actually might be permanent or semi-permanent and you can reverse it. So, uh, alcohol as a coping method when you drink a lot can lead to a lot of, a lot of negative health outcomes. And like I mentioned, uh, you can't necessarily reverse those. Even if you eventually stop being addicted, you might have to live with those uh, effects depending uh, on how the addiction. Um, so now we are gonna go over some healthy coping mechanisms that are alternative to alcohol use. Uh, I'm not gonna go over every single one of these, but a lot of the popular ones are exercise, uh, asking for support through a family member, through a friend or through therapy. Uh, meditation is also a popular one and uh, time management. Uh, personally, I like to turn to music when I feel like I have a lot of stress on my mind and need some way to manage that. And uh, everyone is different in terms of how they cope and how they manage their stress. So definitely don't feel that you have to like something because so many other people do. Um, it's definitely a personal thing. Yeah, so some other alternatives to coping with alcohol uh, is starting routines. So this can kind of help combat stress, for example, of, you know, being stressed out leads to consuming alcohol, starting a routine is really helpful. So examples would be like waking up at similar times every day, exercising, like Evan mentioned, reading, reading's a great one. I'm a little biased as an English major. I think I have to throw that in there, but reading's a great way to cope, kind of help. It's a great way to distract yourself from stress if needed. Uh, and meals, you know, can be really helpful to eat meals at similar times during the day and eating healthy meals in particular makes you feel good. Uh, and eating healthy has actually been shown to help with stress too. So that's another thing to consider uh, when you're making meals and uh, deciding how to put them into your routines. Uh, another thing that you can do is try learning new skills or interests you might have. So music, you know, whether that's listening to music or, you know, Creating music, playing an instrument, that's a great way to cope. Uh, writing in a journal is another great way to cope. It's a little more cathartic. You kind of get your thoughts out. Uh, and journaling also helps with stress in terms of being able to see it on paper can really help cope with it. It's a little less of a burden when you journal. Another useful one is meditation. So meditation has probably been mentioned a lot, but it does really help. Meditation helps kind of ground yourself a little bit. Um, and it doesn't have to be anything super complicated. There's a lot of kind of cool breathing techniques and simple ways to meditate out there on websites and apps. So if you're interested, feel free, take a second to pause here if you want you to go look some up. Uh, I mentioned grounding yourself. So I wanted to mention mindfulness. That's kind of what mindfulness helps you do. It helps you ground yourself, stay in the present because sometimes stress um, can make our thoughts go like 100 miles an hour, we start looking to the future, we start looking to how is this going to affect me. Um, and mindfulness is helpful because it helps put you in the moment for even a second, where maybe you're not thinking about the stress as much, you're more focused on like physical, physical sensations and all, um, which is what the 54321 technique kind of touches about. So uh, depending on what order you go through, it's like, five things you can see, four things you can touch, so on and so forth. And the whole idea is that when you familiarize yourself with your surroundings, uh, you get grounded in where you are and you take a second to really notice where you are and what's kind of going on. Finally, the other alternative I wanted to mention was support from others, as Evan mentioned, uh, because you know it's great getting support. Sometimes when we're really stressed, it's really helpful to go to a friend or loved one or even just someone you trust and sharing with them. Uh, there's a saying, a saying, sorry, that a burden shared is a burden halved, and that can be true sometimes. Sometimes it's just uh, nice to have a helpful ear just kind of listening, maybe giving advice if you want it. Um, and this can also mean going to like a clinician or professional, like someone at the counseling center. And we'll, we'll touch on how to do that if you think that's a step you need to take. But here are some alternatives. And like mentioned before, it's not ex an exhaustive list. These are just some ideas. If there's something else you can think of you think might be a healthy alternative, 
definitely give it a try. But these are just some ideas if for inspiration, if need be. So we also wanted to give some tips and advice on how to cope with stress during the pandemic. Uh, I don't speak for everyone, but I'm pretty sure that for a lot of people, the pandemic has been an overall stressful time. Uh, so the first tip is take care of your body as best as you can. So again, through maybe exercise or sleep or the meals you eat, uh, really take care of yourself and take care of your body. Uh, making time for yourself and unwinding. Uh, so I would really put this in the category of self-care and just taking care of yourself, as it says, um, because it, it's such an important thing to do, especially during this time period when, you know, Zoom fatigue is going on and you're not really able to socialize as much as you want to. And so taking care of yourself and just relaxing is such an important thing to do. Um, continuing and to connect with close people in your life. Uh, that's also uh, something that we found very important to do as well, because again, uh, we are not able to really socialize and get together with the people who are close to us as much as we want to at the moment. And just staying connected through texts, maybe phone calls, FaceTime, is just really important to just maintain those connections and I guess, building up that excitement of being able to see them in person eventually. And the last one is try connecting with your community or faith-based organisms. Um, these are really scary times. And, you know, a lot of us are, as college students, are in a situation when, where we are either by ourselves or just around the same group of people um, all the time. So this is definitely an opportunity to really get yourself out there and become a part of something that I guess is bigger than ourselves, such as our community or faith. And again, these are just tips and advices to maybe help you uh, cope with stress, but um, it's definitely a personal thing, once again. Yeah, and just to note, uh, the last word is organizations, just, just to ensure, sorry, yeah, but I just wanna make sure no one's confused or anything. Yeah, you're, you're totally good. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> no, you're good. No worries. So yeah, uh, kind of the last thing we wanted to touch on was resilience. So resilience is really just how you're able to bounce back from stress and trauma. You know, um, resilience, uh, there's six domains to it. So I'll just go through them super quickly. So the first one is vision, which is purpose, goals, and congruence. So, you know, when you go through something really traumatic or really stressful, uh, something to help sort of bounce back is, you know, to have resilience is to sort of keep in mind what's ahead, what's the goal to go through and to get to, um, and just, you know, keep a vision, even though something might be holding you back, keeping vision as to what the future should hold, what the future, what you want it to look like can really help. Um, the next one's composure. So that means regulating emotions, interpretation bias, comment, and control. So uh, resilience is, because you bouncing back requires some composure. So uh, try your best to stay calm and in control. Try to regulate your emotions as best you can. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean don't have emotions. You know, don't necessarily have to act tough or lock yourself in. But regulating can mean, you know what, maybe you need to let them out. So that means, okay, I let them out. I kind of have them under control now and I can kind of move on. So that's one way to sort of think of composure. Uh, the other one's reasoning. So problem solving, resourcefulness, anticipate and plan. So uh, COVID's been really difficult to deal with and it's changed up a lot of things. It's created a lot of problems. So uh, if possible, the reasoning aspect might be what might happen next and how do we plan for it? You know, what resources do I have available to help me? So that's kind of what reasoning touches on. The next one is health. So nutrition, sleep, and exercise. So this one, I think we've been mentioning a lot, but um, do your best to keep yourself healthy. You know, being healthy, getting enough sleep, uh, exercising, eating well, have, all three have been proven to help with stress and controlling stress levels. So uh, health is really important because when you feel great and when you're doing things to help yourself feel great, um, it's much easier to bounce back uh, when something kind of stressful happens. The next one's tenacity. So persistence, realistic optimism, and again, bounce back, I keep saying, but 
Um, tenacity is just having the persistence, you know, thinking, okay, I am going to get through this. I am going to be able to do this. Um, but also being realistic, you know, maybe you won't bounce back right away. You know, resilience is not a linear road. There might be some setbacks, you know, maybe composure goes under, reasoning goes under. Um, but it's good to be realistic too. Optimism in this case can mean, okay, I had a setback, but I can still get through this. It's still possible to get through this. And then finally, collaboration. Support networks, social context, you know, managing perceptions. Um, you know, as humans, we're social creatures. You know, we, a lot of us need to socialize. A lot of us need to be with people. And it's really hard because COVID um, makes that really difficult. But kind of like Evan mentioned, you know, doing Zoom calls, doing phone calls, if you're vaccinated or you're able to socially distance meeting up with people can be really useful because bouncing back means we have a good support system. We have a good support network there to back us if things go wrong. So those are examples of how the six domains of resilience might uh, play in part when dealing with stress. So as we come to a close with our presentation, we wanted to go over some resources. Uh, we split up the resources into local resources and regional and national resources. Um, just to highlight a few things, um, the Counseling Center uh, is definitely always an option. Uh, Rosecrans, uh, Alcoholics Anonymous, which is on both sides. And uh, so if you ever feel the need and you feel that your alcohol consumption is becoming some sort of problem for you, then please feel free to um, look at these resources and contact uh, these organizations. Yeah, and so for the local ones, we also gave the phone number. So feel free to pause here for a second, take a picture if need be. Uh, here are some phone numbers to access these resources. You can also find them online if you Google them. And so to, the same thing for the regional national ones that Evan touched on briefly. Uh, if you need to, feel free to go back in the video for a second. And you can also look those, look those up by going online. Uh, one of them is an actual website, so you can just kind of uh, copy and paste it or write it uh, in the URL. But we also wanted to provide a way to contact local resources uh, if need be. And then, so, oh, we're missing something. Oh, no, I guess not. Yeah, but here are some of the sources we had. Oh, so feel free to take a picture of this if need be. And if you stuck through till the end, thank you for watching. We really appreciate it. And we hope this helped in any way. Thank you.